So today we have lecture four. It's our fourth day, and uh, it's very exciting for me for that students by the way. You know, that I uh, after lecture is done, the topic is still goes in my mind for a couple of more hours. So then you cannot work in the night. So today is going to be very very interesting. We are going to talk about innovation opportunities. So. We have talked about technology, all the technical buzzwords and the real world. So we are talking with us talk about today what we can do from the innovation point of view. And I'm going to present to you today some big idea. Big idea. If any one of them excites you, or some of you, you can become the next uh, multi-billionaire. That's what we're going to talk about today, how to make money out of computer blockchain and I already talked about that and let's move forward since this technology is so new right now there are totally unlimited opportunities totally unlimited and this at the stage where the internet was in 1991 1995 I know many of you are not born that time, by the way, or with all of you. I was born. I was a CIO for the first time in America, in Boston. Very first time, young CIO. Internet was getting born that time. I did nothing to the internet that time. I, just, I saw it getting born. And many companies and many countries missed opportunities in the internet world. Many of them. And many, or some, Grabbed the opportunity and they became Amazon, Google, eBay, Yahoo, all kinds of internet based companies. And after that, all the banks and all the stores, everyone is now on the internet. In fact, every person is on the internet right, right now. They can't survive without that. So, this is an unlimited opportunity now, and we don't want to miss India and you guys, your generation. I call you there's a blockchain generation. So if anyone asks you guys what generation you belong to, what the answer will be? We say, what generation you belong to? Blockchain. blockchain generation. You're not generation Z or Y or X, you are blockchain generation. That's what you want. And how the question is basically, how do we create value? How do we create profit from a business point of view? Because no business can survive if it is not self-sustainable, self-sustained. And that means profit. You have profit for the business to have, to plow back, to grow the business. And how do we bring the cryptographic innovation? Cryptography has been in the world for a long, long time. But in the, in the application world, the blockchain platform has made it possible to use that cryptographic linkages between different kinds of data stored in what is called blocks. We will talk about what blocks are, and I'm assuming all of you know what blocks are now. And what needs to be done to leverage and mainstream Cryptography is very hard from a mathematics point of view. Very hard. So many people say, oh my God, like it's beyond my, my brain power. I'm telling you, it is not beyond your brain power. All of you, each of you, can understand that really, really well. The key point is how to be mainstream it. Instead of only some few people knowing about it or using it, how we can make it a mass scale, mass movement, the usage of cryptographic algorithms in applications. That's the key point, basically. And how you guys, how the blockchain generation can invent, innovate the next Google, different name by the way, next Google, next Facebook, next Amazon. What you guys can do, basically. That's the question I need you guys to ask when you go back to your door. How can academia, the schools, IIT Gandhi Nagar, IIT Kanpur, IIT Delhi, other schools, uh, GTU, I think someone told me, uh, from GTU, from, there are some students here from, from there. 
So how the academia can help to speed up the adoption of the cryptographic algorithms in mainstream applications, basically. Because it's not all the problems are not solved yet, right? All the research required to be done is not done yet. So what the schools can do, you have to ask your professors and their PhD students, the MTech students who are doing research, basically. So these are the kind of main two main questions here. I'm posing to all of you, all of you, and then we go, let's look at some of the opportunities basically. Because we can't talk about 10 opportunities, but I'm going to talk about some opportunities which are really, really big. So the space I see is very vast and and diverse. Diverse from the industry point of view. There is not one major industry I cannot see uh, that blockchain cannot be applied to. Cryptographic algorithms embedded in blockchain can't apply to. I don't know of any industry. Look at some of the items, big items in some industry. I mentioned lecture number two about ownership of everything. You own land, you own home, you own grades, you own certificates, you own diplomas, you own awards, you own uh, uh, some shares in a, in a company, uh, you own some bonds by the way. So whatever you own which is valuable to you, like jewelry for example, you own insurance, right? Insure your life, insure your house, insure your car. So you own lots of stuff. That's life, right? If there's no ownership, there's no life basically. You say you the life, own something, right? So ownership of everything can be blockchainized. I made a verb just now. Blockchainized. It's your property. It's a part of ownership as well. Schools, companies have some people IP. Individuals like you also have individual IP. Your certificates, your diploma, your awards, your your other things, right? In the locker you get. This individual property. So IP can be virtual property, IP can be also individual property as well. Customer contracts, they are very, very valuable. In fact, using smart contracts, you can make them automatically executable. Supplier contracts. So in business, you have customers, you have suppliers. You are in the middle. They can be also blockchainized, so to speak. Drug tracking. Drug is not the bad drugs here, necessarily. You have medicines. So from manufacturers to mouths. When manufacturers manufacture each tablet, each capsule, each bottle can be authentically tracked from manufacturing to the mouth. And why should be tracked by the way? There's a recall sometimes. Some sometimes things are found that some medicine is causing bad effect. So what if for the government? So from a recall point of view, don't want only the medicine name. You want the bag, you want each tablet, each capsule. You suppose someone puts some bad chemicals in your lab, the bad guy, the, the, the terrorist. Suppose it happens. You want to track that and want to have a recall immediately. How do you do that in a in an authentic manner? In a trustworthy, tamper proof manner? Blockchain. Marijuana. Now it's not a drug you want to promote, but some states in USA are making it legal for entertainment purposes. In my village in Bihar, where I grew up, the village was 500 people, there were only five ganja smokers, only five. And every evening, these five old people, they sit together to smoke ganja. It's called marijuana, by the way, in English. So, so in America, it's a unique thing, it's a novel thing to allow for people to recreational use of, of marijuana, ganja, basically, you know Okay, India got it was legal for a long, long time. You know, can go and, and buy it. You see, in my village, you wait and buy it. So, what you can do to design a big application, a very smart application based on blockchain, to try marijuana from the seed to consumption, 
See, to sell. Why you want to do that? Every government wants to try that drug. It's not a medicine drug. It's a drug that's coming back to your brain in a very bad way. So governments want to track that. Not only the seed, by the way, but study the genetic material of the seed. It's a huge application. Especially in America and Europe, Europe countries, Canada, Canada is legal you know, at the country level. In the USA, it is not legal at the national level. Only some states have allowed that. So tracking that is a good, good thing to do because government will give you lots of money if you have the data basically each seed grows the plant how the plant is growing and how it is getting sold from wholesale to retail to consumption by the year now the guys and girls who are consuming it they don't want to be known by the year that i spoke ganja yesterday but guess what anonymity is allowed in blockchain you can be anonymous now someone has talked about bad guys right so we call them bad guys okay academic accreditation of Upgradications, diplomas, degrees. In the next 80, 90 years, the world is going to have 10 billion people roughly. The projection is 11 billion people. So I'm making it 10 billion to be easy to remember. Roughly half of them will be working at any one time. Roughly. <coughs> Let the people who don't work anymore, people like me, and then the people who are children, like you guys are studying right now, right? Then some people don't want to work at all because they are healthy and mind is good, right? So if you look at that, and if you think of the idea of capturing everyone's credential from after high school, since high school, on a global basis, on a global basis, you will have a data of five billion people, their individual intellectual property on blockchain. You see, five billion people you will have. Facebook today has 2 billion users. But think about the power of these guys. And why people will love to put their degrees there? Temper proofing. Your employer will want to know did you get the degree? Did you go to IIT Gandhi? They look really you did. Did you get the GPA of 4.4 out of 4? Guess what? Once they know this is blockchain, temper proof basically locked up. <coughs> they wanted to call anyone to verify whether you have to ID or not. This is good application, your application. Say, ha ha. It's right here. I trust you. And guess what? MIT from last year, last semester, we already started to give its, uh, its, uh, its grades in blockchain. This diploma already. MIT. It's only for MIT, by the way. Think about doing such a Gandhi Nagar and make it global from here. Think about that possibility. Design an application here for IG Gandhi Nagar, convince Dr. Sudhir Jain and all the professors, everyone else, can put all the GPAs and CPAs in, the, in your application. And once your degree comes here, your degree also gets a scan, and not a scan, but degree itself can, can go there. Think about it. And then part is, oh, you go to this application, this is my uh, public key, and you'll find, find it there. Think about it as a possibility and from IT Gandhi Nagar, make it India wide. From India, make it worldwide. Really worldwide, like global. Five billion people, educational stuff in your database. Think about it. You become a billionaire. Personal digital identity. It relates to somewhat in the previous one. But who am I? Where do I come from? What other folk, my father, mother, whoever, or whatever you want to relate to the world from your personal digital identity. So these are the kind of things, there are big things waiting to be done in this area. Many startup companies are nibbling at some of the aspects here and there, but my goal for two weeks here, one the goal, to excite some of you to the extent where you can get your job you want to get, and on the side for side, you can make some other, other big pagdandi, you know. So once you don't want to work anymore, after two, three years, guess what? You already have an application up and running on a global scale. You become the next Mark Zuckerberg, next Bill Gates, next Bezos or Big Black. That's a dream basically I want to around with you. Sir, <coughs> please. What is the just a basic difference between protecting data from uh, 
blockchain and protecting data, data using cyber security. How much is the data secured if we do uh, go with the cyber security? Yes. So cyber security efforts right now, they are another layer on the top of applications, networks, servers, databases. Blockchain technology through cryptographic methods is enabling that security at that very stuff. So if you want to steal something from me, you won't know any of what it is. So instead, so let's look at the, the, this room here, this door there, right? So cyber security is like a door there, and the other door, another door, another lock, right? But blockchain is here where everyone is wearing a big steel kind of uh, cover head to toe. So we have, each of us are totally fortified, so, so they can break the door, but we are so fortified that they can't shoot at us. Say, say analogy, analogy is going with that part, right? Don't take it literally, okay? But that's what we have. Yeah. Any questions on this one? Now, the time is right to do all these things. Why the time is right? Compute is cheap now. On the smartphone, you can calculate a hash of your name or anything you want to do by it. Okay? Storage is dirt cheap now. And variable. You don't have to pay money to buy lots of hard disks and all this stuff. I remember 1984, my guy under me came to me to buy a hard disk, 60 meg, meg drive, $60,000. How much uh, storage you can have on your smartphone now? Times have changed. You don't have to pay sixty thousand dollars for sixty meg drive anymore. Okay. Network functions are getting virtualized. Overhead in managing centralized cluster systems becoming high. Centralized systems and blockchain applications are decentralized. <coughs> don't have a data center. So decentralized. So overhead is much lower. So from a cost point of view, it's the right time to go full blast on the blockchain innovation. Now, I'm going to drop some of the stuff which I have been doing by the for the last two years, roughly. I have been conceptualizing some ideas on my own. What can be done? Some of you may have seen my card, card said IP blockchain. I also have a domain name called iLockchain. So take took the key out, just I lock it. And there's no company right now, but on the I lock <coughs> project, I'm visualizing some big idea basically. And what that big idea I'm going to describe to you guys is a, a vision for a sovereign digital person. And I'll explain what that sovereign digital person means by this. Okay. Look at this poet, it's an English poet. From 18th century, 1731 to 1800 AD, William, William Cooper, or Bill Cooper, we we'll call him Bill in America, William Cooper. See what he says. He says, I am monarch of all I survey. My right there is none to dispute. From the center all round to the sea, I am lord of the fowl. I am the brute. Oh, solitude, where are the charms? Their sages have seen in thy face better dwell in the midst of alarm than reign in this horrible place. That's what this guy wrote in 18th century. Look at this chart here now. There the poet envisioned, I am monarch of all I serve. Guess what? Now we are not a monarch of anything we serve. Him. That's the fact right now. Look at these companies. Google, market cap, 700 billion, maybe it's 800 billion now. Banks, their total, of how much money they have, asset value. Apple, all these credit cards. It's all about you, about me, about consumer, about the person. But guess what, who has the data about us? We don't have the data about us, they have the data. Facebook says, like, put the photo there, put the video there. It's your data. You are the content creator. Guess who owns it? Facebook. 
They are making the money out of it. Not you. You're making no money. Facebook is giving you no money, basically. You are wasting your time, using your time to put photos and everything else and comments and like and there's no dislike button because then Facebook won't work. Right? <laughs> Look at credit checks. Did I pay my bills? You pay your bills. But you don't do the credit checking for the banks and other people. The other companies doing the credit checking for you, they're making money out of that. It's your information for Christ's sake. Look at government, right? Look at the, the Amazon. You're buying the stuff. Amazon has all the information of what you bought yesterday, today, day before yesterday, everything. Okay? So all these companies have become more than trillion dollar company in market capitalization together, together. They're getting your data from you, and you're getting nothing of that. What you're getting? Convenience, basically. You are, you are giving everything about yourself. Who you are, what you're buying, what you're liking, who your friends are, who your family is, where do you live, by the way. Because location, GPS tracking going on. So a smartphone, you are here, go to the door, people will know where you are right now. They put the ads for the wrong kind of situation. So look at this one here. So who is my friend? Who is my family? Who am I? What I'm buying? What I'm liking? What I'm hating? These guys know you don't own anything. Basically. If you look at the poet's vision of I am monarch of all I serve, it, that is not true anymore at all. It's all about me. But my my Median net worth eighty thousand dollars in two thousand thirteen in USA. In USA, median net worth of a person, American person, five years ago was eighty thousand dollars. Look at this company's market cap. Many, many more times more than net worth of an American person. Think about it. I see his data, the whole data, not there, basically. They are making money out of you, okay? And these guys, all these guys, Google, banks, credit check companies, Facebook, government, Amazon, card companies, Apple, all these guys, these guys own a digital me. They own a digital you. You own nothing, basically. Nothing at all. They are then hosted in an asymmetrical power relationship. They have more power over us. I know it sounds like a politics here, but it's not politics. It's an asymmetrical situation. We are giving them all the info about us on our own, and they are more powerful because of us. Think about it. How asymmetrical the power structure between these companies and entities is between us and them, basically. So, summary of that whole thing is, I'm not the monarch of all I serve. I'm not. From the center all around to the sea of the foul and the brood. I'm not monarch anymore. Even though my right there is not to dispute, it's my data. I own my information. Even though that's true, how do I own me back? That is a question I have envisioned last year. How do I own me back? How do you own you back? Own yourself back. What do you do? And a bigger real world problem as well. It's a bigger real world problem. So that's a much more philosophical problem. How they own, own me back. So real world issue. They sell digital me. They get my data, they sell to other people. Okay? They borrow money. They make money off digital me. Digital me gets paid in convenience, not in cash. Amazon, Google, all these guys, Facebook, they don't give us any money at all. Oh, you put your 10 photos, here's your money for that. You don't do that. Okay? They get hacked on a massive scale. Many companies or worldwide get hacked almost every year and the personal data gets left. Yahoo got hacked, for example, three billion client accounts got, got hacked. Three billion. One company does credit checking in America last year got hacked in a big way. Driver license, uh, your uh, social security number, everything gone. Everything basically. I don't want to name the company's name, but you can tell me. Google, okay? I was really angry. I, I my stuff got lost too, they're gone. So I do change everything, basically. Yeah, you don't know if you lost your school, but you know. So 
Equifax. Okay, sorry, the name is already here. Equifax called digital debt. I call them digital debt to 150 million American people and some Europeans as well, by the way. Digital debt is the fake I coined after that hiking of Equifax. They call the digital debt of 150 million people and no one got prosecuted or executed. No one, by the way. No one. There are lawsuits against the company, but for that digital debt, it's worse than 9 11 in America, in my view, by the way. Worse than 9 11. But no one got sued and taken to court right away and jail, basically. No one. Okay? So that digital debt, we got to avoid, basically. We have to. Indeed, I said that's a 9 11 moment for all of us who lost their, their data. What do we do? <clears throat> I logged in. So the concept of I logs and project will unchain you. You will be enslaved. How? So, so I <clears throat> never understand one thing. For example, this Tuesday, he, the Yahoo was hacked last year. So, for example, I have, an, I have, an, account, yeah. I have an account in Yahoo. It's mm -hmm. being hacked. So, what they will do with my data? Oh. I don't, but the, generally we don't put our bank account details on the Yahoo as well. Uh, generally we have a cell phone number or email ID, nothing more than that. Okay, so there's a question, how do we do? Yes. Do you get spam mails or messages on your phone? Yes. How do we know that this is the person of spam or it's an email? So how it is related the to the sale, what the hiker do? They get the email, phone number, for example, <coughs> to sell to marketing companies or any other company they want to, okay. and they get money paid for that. Okay, and then the marketeers, a spammer, a spammer, or send marketing messages. That's one thing. Second thing that many people use their email address, for example, for other accounts. Example, Facebook. First thing, username, blah, blah, blah. right? Password, different, right? So you already give them away, not you are. The hackers already have one piece of information for many of your personal accounts you have everywhere nowadays. And each person nowadays at least has 10 accounts, this is, but this game is 15, 10, right? So that's the answer this is. Uh, that's what they do. They, they steal it and they, and they, and they sell it. Uh, so the idea about uh, behind the is to unchain <coughs> digital slave like you and me, this is. How do you do that? What other technology you need? I never talked about that yet. Today I'm going to talk about that briefly, one or two slides. Homomorphically encrypted cloud interaction. That's a key, a new technology word I'm going to share today with you. And blockchain technology foundation. You combine blockchain technology platform with homomorphic encryption technology, then that whole digital me, digital you can be enslaved. You can be the master of all you survey. So, all these, these guys, again, same guys, I call them bad guys now for this class, making money of you. How do you get money to you? Either from them or prevent them from uh, making money from your data. So, what does in any application or many applications you want to do operations, right? You want to do 2 plus 3 equals 5, for example. A plus B equals C. And the question about encryption is how do you do that? If I encrypt my uh, balance in my bank, let's say it's 1000 rupees, right? And I encrypt that and it make it 1000 times 2, make it 2000. So you don't know how much money I have, I'm only fuzzing it, right? It's called encryption in a very simple way, right? So you don't know really that I have 1,000, you say 2,000, I have 2,000 because I would buy by 2, okay, encryption. So how do I, now, I might become 2,000, you have, you have 3,000 rupees, and you're in the same encryption technology, for by 2, so that became 3,000 times 2, 6,000. So you add the two, two together, right? Then you have to go back to get the original numbers. How do you do that? The method is called homomorphic, homomorphicity. Meaning that what it does, homomorphic encryption retains the structure. So if you encrypt A, 
encrypt B, and if you add them together, encrypt A, encrypt B, add them together, and decrypt again, you should be able to get A plus B. <coughs> get it? This is very key, so please don't get it, raise your hand. If, if you encrypt A, encrypt B, and suppose I get that two of them, and if I add it, right, I don't know how to get A and B, or A plus B, I don't know that, right? Unless I get the encryption method, or decryption method, then I can get it, right? So this, the beauty of homomorphic encryption is it returns the structure. You can do, you can do math on that. And that is very, very important from a data point of view. Get it? Yeah, you can use a particular kind of encryption method and decryption method. You can choose. Right now, the simple example I'm giving here, let us say two numbers, five and ten. So my encryption is very childish, like simple. Multiply by two, each of them. And so five plus ten becomes ten plus twenty. That's encrypted now. Number is twenty. Right? So you can see that A of 5 and 10 is B, 10, 20, right? Then we flip it back to get A of 5 and 10. So just remember this. The paper from MIT, you can Google that, and if you don't have a send to uh, Mr. Pandey, that's very interesting paper. So some MIT students have used homomorphicity in blockchain to do some uh, good applications. So we'll send you the URL tonight or tomorrow. Uh, sir, uh, encryption. If I uh, encrypt it, the encrypted message can be uh, like encrypted message. Uh, it can be made, can be made public. It cannot. Be, message uh, like a random but message. then I have to uh, the system has to know the encryption algorithm all the time. So instead, if it simply knows the simple message, the decrypted version. So the system. That's the point you're making. Exactly say what you're saying. So the system, the application, when you sign the application, we have to know that. So we are not making that public, right? We are not making our encryption algorithm public because it's like giving your private key away, so to speak, right? Uh, algorithm, we can make it public. So like private yeah, but, key is correct. Yeah. And uh, algorithm, we can make it public unless uh, the private key is known to anybody. Nobody can take it. Yeah. So math, math, by the algorithm can be public. Hide the map, right? But yeah, good. So, <coughs> remember this another word, and maybe this is the last word I would use from a technology point of view homomorphic encryption. The blockchain can do wonderful things basically. It can help you guys to someday become, become one of those people or different name company, but very famous big company like those guys someday for the blockchain generation. And built on blockchain technology foundation, as I mentioned earlier, right? And already have seen this before, but I thought to repeat that because practice and avyas, avyas called practice, this becomes perfect. Excuse me, sir. With practice and avyas, things become perfect. So you can see again, Repeat of immutability. What that will do? Temper proofing digital me. My data, my stuff, temper proof. Cryptographic security. <coughs> guards at the core, not at the door. Guards, every element is guarded, not just the door there. All of us have a 45 steel case around us. Sorry, please go. So the goal here is just uh, the other. Uh, unknown authorities will not be able to use my data. Exactly. So the third one, when I want to know you to know me, <coughs> if I want you to know me, then okay. If I don't want you to know me what I like, what I buy, even though I bought it from Amazon, I don't want Amazon to know that what I bought, I don't want Facebook to know what I like by the way, who my family folks are, who my friends are, then I want to follow the follow the my law that you can't know about me if I don't want you to know about me. Okay? And proven technology. So right now, 
you know, I have been less than 10 years, right? Maybe five, six years on application. And guess what? It's not born yesterday. So it's four, five, six years old, right? And and many people have proven that applications work for different situations. So homework. How can different elements, I'm giving the name I love chain, just say the, the imagination <coughs> basically. You can you can make your own name by the way, right? For the name for I create in Gujarat, I heard yesterday it got inaugurated. Uh, Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu yeah. of Israel they together uh, with the inauguration of I create. So it's an I love chain, you can call whatever you want to call by the way, right? Think of the idea, okay, on what innovation. An application can be created using blockchain. Okay, I have I have given some ideas how to fight the battle of the big guys, Google, the Facebook, the Amazon, all those guys. But think what your own ideas to find a find a big war, not a battle, war. Basically, battles are tiny, wars are big. And you are young, you can afford to do that. You can afford to dream big. That's the message. And now. Uh, on the example I give you, I talked about the drug and bad drugs, not the, not the healthy drugs. So the marijuana industry, look at 2014, around $5 billion in USA. Look at the 2020, it's going to be $22 billion. Just in USA, by the way, right now, based upon what states have been approved from a from recreational in the Ganga. Uh, this is the biggest process I have drawn. But what you want, I just you guys not have seen this. I drew it uh, last year from seed genetics to seed mother. They call it mother seed, okay? A mother seed that grows a plant and all stuff. Seed they create hybrid seeds as well. The hybrid is a plant to make hybrids of different kinds. Genetics testing is done. Seed supplier management, right? From right from there, and you can see all the way from here to here. Grading management when the plant is grown, harvest management, growth management, environment management, how much water, how much temperature, how much moisture in the air when the plant is grown. It's a very complicated process, guys. In India, just you put the ganja plant, the sugar can fill. That's what the bad guys do in my village. They put the height of the ganja plant, sugar can fill, and there's a height that they go and cut it out from there. Okay? But in, in America, it's a science now, it's a science and technology. Okay? It's a done. Everything is properly measured, done, stored, everything else. From seed genetics of ganja to distribution, tax management, legal, audit, government, right? The government must audit how much ganja got sold, grown, grown, sold, and consumed. Blockchain is the ideal place to put all those things. Governments will love his eyes. They love his eyes. If you can make an application, based upon this business processing. Government will love it. You can give to US government, government in Canada. I bet some of you are doing this, by the way, but you can make a better application. There's always room for competition, right? Suppose the guys in Canada are doing it, US is doing this. You can make a better tool at a lower cost, a better application, following this process. And then you can sell it in America. You have your software over a cloud, People can see on the, they can use it there, the way you use Google here, you use Amazon here, you use Facebook here. They can use your application. I give a name too, by the way. I always give a name to an idea, right? Marisa. You know what Marisa stands for? Let's, let's go back. Marijuana, marijuana seed to sell application. <laughs> uh, plus, Marisa is a nice, lovely name. So I gave a name to that, Marisa. First was I love chain. This is Marisa. Not to know that's a application for Ganja. Marijuana. <laughs> Sorry, Gary, I believe Indian word for marijuana, but if you only heard about Ganja in California. <laughs> and analytics and reports, by the way. The government wants analytics reports. Uh, if uh, the shopkeeper, the retail wholesaler, the, the farmer of Ganja wants to get report, you can get all these things from end to end, basically. The idea behind my is like that end to end marijuana tracking. Same process or similar process can apply to guess what? Medicine. It will not be will not be seen, right? But but chemicals <coughs> or chemical ingredients, compositions, uh, proportion, ratios, 
Same thing can also uh, apply to uh, tracking, tracking anything which needs to be audited and tracked and tamper proof. Similar method of different kind can be applied to those kind of things as well. Global supply chain finance, SCF, supply chain finance. Right now, this is the process. Supplier, in this is Hong Kong, supplier in America, buyer in India. Uh, SCF, supply chain finance platform, there, there are already technology platforms today. This whole process, <coughs> one, two, the supplier sends invoice to buyer, right? Because after supplier has shipped the stuff, you get invoice. Buyer then submits the approved invoices electronically to supply chain finance platform. They are available today. At, at maturity day, buyer's clearing, clearing account is instructed by SCF with the date that on this date they clear the invoice. Right? You have to know, know the process. So then, so one, two, the supplier also sends to the SCF the price view receivables online, but they have to receive money. From the, from the buyer. So this platform has the, this loop, one, two, three loop. And then number four, banking partners, their banks, suppliers and, and, and customers, they have the two banks, they're not all the same bank, and with the same bank, the two accounts this year. If I am a supplier, you are a customer in the same bank, it's a different account, right? otherwise you're a mess. Right? So that's how this whole thing works basically. It takes several days to weeks nowadays in the global transaction. It's not easy. Don't get the money right away. You don't. So think about it. Even though the current Bitcoin application takes 10 minutes to add a block. You know what the 10 minutes thing? Even Ethereum takes minutes, not seconds, right? Reducing the days and weeks to hour, one hour. So much cash will be released in the system, in the supply chain system, or lots of liquidity is called, meaning cash. Lots of liquidity will be released in the system. You can, you can cut down from days and weeks to hours. So even 10 minutes sounds longer, by the way, but when you are talking about days and weeks here, between an Indian supplier and a, and a Hong Kong customer, Chinese customer, you cut that down to hours, it's a big, big improvement, massive improvement, and, and suppliers, they love liquidity, because that's what gets them going, right? If the liquidity cash is not coming, they can't manufacture anything, right? So this is another, another opportunity three by the way, I talked about high blockchain kind of stuff to unlock the digital <coughs> mean, unslave us, from Google's and Facebook's and all those, Amazon's, all those guys. And then I talked about Marisa, my lovely name Marisa, for marijuana industry. Then third opportunity, big opportunity, is in the global, global supply chain, supply chain finance. So there are three big opportunities I want to present today to you guys. And I have this domain name called IndiaChange.com, IndiaChange.org, NITI.io, had the domain called IndiaChain.com. So I got chains, not chain, because there are many blockchains, many chains, right? So if you guys want to play with uh, domain uh, websites, uh, I can give you one of my uh, domain, either .com or, or .org. You can use that to make a website, or you can uh, do blogging, or, or, or get the conferences now, all, all kinds of stuff you can do. Conferences, blogging, all the things, right? But just example. So you can use indiachains.com or .org to do all these things, membership, blog, YouTube videos, Twitter, LinkedIn feed, chat, discussion forum, events, organization, internship, apprenticeship, competitive seed, angel funding, development option, uh, news feed, platform and application. So if anyone is excited about it after end of next week, send an email to me, say you want to use one of these uh, domain names. Free, free to you, okay? I can design a website, and guess what on the website? You can do all those things. And become the, <coughs> become the blockchain guru in India. Because they all they become your website. 
They will come to IndiaChange.com or .org, whatever you guys choose to do. And everyone in India will come for the events on blockchain, uh, seminars on blockchain, uh, membership, all kinds of stuff. You can also make money out of it as well by selling ads on their site. If people want to sell ads about blockchain applications for blockchain technology, you can make money out of that as well. So you can do all these things using one of the domain names by the way, if you want. Now, I've spoken for almost 45 to 50 minutes. I take up, sorry. Sir, uh, is this limited to just blockchain or health and innovation also? Okay, my intention of, of getting those domain names was blockchain. That's why I call them indiachange.org and indiachange.com. And give that to one of the, uh, one or two or three of you from here, you can become the blockchain guru. One of my IIT classmates, he lives in Texas, uh, in Dallas, in, in Texas, USA. Uh, well, I, was, I told him that I'm teaching here in IIT Dominator. And then he said, the colors of blockchain something. So in our, my batchmates, the colors of Bakayat. So IIT campus, so I'm batch in Bakayat batch, okay? Don't ask why Bakayat, so that's what we are called. So I said, why don't you call me blockchain Bakayat? You guys know anything about Bakay? Bakay, Bakay T. Anyone from the Hindi belt? Yes, the person who speaks in the the person who speaks anything, you know, Bakna, Bakwas. Bakay T, like a loud mouth, right? So my belt was loud mouth, real boisterous, boisterous, right? So he calls me black, black, blockchain Bakay now. So anyway, so so I'm doing Bakay T for last four days. So, so it's only for blockchain like that because I don't want to use this uh, domain name for, uh, for something else. So any of you who gets excited about becoming a guru in India, send email to me and say, okay, get the domain name, I want it. You can do the website design and, and start uh, doing all those things about blockchain. Everything related to blockchain. In India, I got more. So it becomes the one place to go to. Uh, so I become in a girl, Students can take a reading there. This is it. To my knowledge, no one is doing it. No. I in Delhi, I the capital crossroads, no one is doing it. I do not know. It's a good name too. It's a, it's a very catchy name. Right? So people know it's India change, right? Niti Yog has India change, not change. So they let them have singular, it's a plural here. So anyway, so this is my friend uh, Mr. Pandey. We need help now. To switch the video. You are already loaded. Does any one of you uh, can try to, to uh, unplug this one here?
Bitcoin network allows you to connect and block you, uh, use block of pieces to figure out what works best for your, what is, your particular use cases. It's still in the beta phase, like most things in the blockchain space, so it's not actually going to be yet. But the idea is for there to be a standard for enterprise software, for enterprise blockchain software and tools that you can put in your place. Give consensus, which is another popular company, you've probably heard of this if you're doing any research on the side. Consensus is an indicator for Ethereum folks' applications, startups, and all the tools. We know that consensus is this umbrella company that has all these different smaller initiatives. It has Gnosis, which is one of those decentralized prediction markets we talked about. It has MetaMask, which is a global extension that allows you to interact with Ethereum using uh, through a web app. It has Starter, which allows you more easily migrate, compile, and work on smart contracts. And uh, several other small names will fit under this giant umbrella. It was founded in 2015 by Joe Lubin, a co founder of Ethereum, and it's, uh, as I mentioned, this idea of a central company with all these different small ventures that all have their own specific mission, that they're trying, uh, their own specific mission. And uh, this is also just to provide more infrastructure for Ethereum, it allows for developers to not have to do the struggle of making big uh, computers themselves or dealing with the hassle of uh, getting around in a happy way. So they have some standard method that they can create and use smart contracts and connect to them. The consensus is a lot of outreach actually to help the space to develop. For example, they had they have the, the Ethereum conference, which was last weekend, and a hackathon was hosted here, actually, at UC Berkeley in Haas, by Washington Berkeley, on uh, a hackathon two weeks ago. So their goal is to reach out to the community and spur up as many of these new uh, independent ventures as they can. Then you have ARM3. ARM3 is an initiative to get a bunch of banks together. They notice that banks has a lot of issues, especially with international banking, and the amount of time it takes for one bank to confirm that uh, some payment is valid or that's going to go through. If you've ever, ever dealt with international banks, you notice it takes days for things to go through, and even nationally, there's a lot of inefficiencies in the banking system because of my trust. So the idea is through the chain, blockchain, you're now able to connect a bunch of banks onto this central platform. Uh, so our three is focused on developing Florida, which supplies an open source distributed ledger platform type of things. And the idea was just to make things much easier for banks in the digitization and to take away a lot of the intermediary struggles the bank space, validating uh, passive things and confirming your roles faster. Are there any questions about some of those uh, players? Sweet. I'll talk about use cases and industries. It's very important so to keep up that are going to necessarily work, but there was that we've been seeing popping up and uh, urge to think about what, whether or not they're going to work. So, first, looking at automobility, uh, if you've heard of Daimler, that's the company that's the umbrella company for Mercedes Benz, and it's like IBM and Linux. And, uh, for the hyper project in February 2017, they were aiming to develop both the blockchain and IoT use cases. Uh, they were looking into funding for blockchain research. They actually released a bond uh, before the entire bond transaction from start to finish over a private blockchain network that they developed. So they acquired this European payment startup called Paypatch to support the Bitcoin payments so as to experiment with sending perhaps smart and car payments. That way, you no longer need to uh, do it manually. For example, uh, you're now able to, for whatever reason, uh, if you need some transaction to machines, you now have the ability to natively transact the price between the machines. Which is way too, way too and it's also interests uh, sort of a little off of the machine aspect, which is about data integrity and data sharing with other auto companies. Because we know that. Data sharing, the more information you have, the better research you can do, so you can be some sort of data marketplace perhaps. This is the data sharing exchange, or very interesting things. If you can use a blockchain to make these uh, mark to make this marketplace or uh, to make it easier to share information. So what you can do is pay vehicle owners by using some joke. We're all driving or 
for those of us who drive, we are going to be driving anyway, and we're going to be fixing the situation. We might as well get compensated for the work that we're going to be doing anyway. So through having a token that's paid out to us every time we give information to the server, to some entity that wants it, then we can share the information, get get in a response to token, which we can use for whatever payments we want to use them for. So this incentivizes drivers to actually share their information, and it also allows drivers to keep their information private if they don't necessarily want to share it. And this allows for the development of what looks like a Either it's a database where you can see a whole slew of information, or even a centralized marketplace where people can sell their information at certain rates depending on what those clients are going to look like. And that's what uh, these two different issues are trying to do. And some other use cases are natural. Uh, keeping track of automobile uh, parts, uh, you have the natural supply chain use case uh, in order to track where parts have come from. And more importantly, to track where parts have come from in the event of failure, you can look up like a certain parts ID and see the whole history of where it was from start to finish. So that way, if you see that some of your batch of parts is failing, you can now more reliably get to the source of which places were manufacturing these parts, and then from there, more reliably fix the fix the source of the problem. You also have the idea of machine to machine payments. So it's interesting to imagine if you have two cars or a few cars that are trying to bet for some open spot in the lane, and they could be sending money to each other or, or betting with each other about who's going to be able to get into the spot. And a person, every person wants to say that I will put up a 0.05 ether if you let me slip into the spot. So they can, uh, the other cars can actually work holes once these cars have uh, rearranged, however, maybe if one car slowed down and gave access to another car, that other car is able to fit from this other lane. These, all these cars report on what happened. They report that this car slowed down to allow for this other car to move in, and because of that, this transaction of this amount needs to go through because this car said they were willing to do that based on the circumstances. So if we can objectively identify that something has or has not happened, it's a really good use case for a smart contract because you're just automating uh, some process rather than checking out the human execution error. So by doing that, it's pretty straightforward. You can just uh, have the machines bet amongst each other and then resolve by sending the information about what happened to the network. And you can even pay external accounts, tolls, or for vehicle uh, charging stations. And, uh, there are examples in uh, Germany, and we have some other ones in California. And this is the idea of car sharing. This one's tricky because, like anything in the sharing economy, there's a lot of human judgment that's required. Would you feel comfortable renting out your car to a stranger? Even if you knew that you could trace it or that you knew who had taken it, what do you do if someone had 2200 miles on it? What do you do if someone actually hit another car? You have to make sure that you have some central entity that's enforcing whatever laws and regulations you want implemented in this decentralized system. This is why it's hard to completely decentralize Uber or to completely decentralize the Airbnb. How do you, in a decentralized manner, ascertain whether or not some Airbnb is healthy enough or clean enough to be used by other people? This all comes down to the judgment because each someone who's some human, unless you have some very good artificial intelligence, is making judgment. Is that new spaces that you're right? talking about? Naturally, these guys are going to want to get a bunch of banks that are trying to do some action with each other. They don't necessarily trust each other. What does it sound like? It sounds like a sum block from new space. That's what Ripple trying to do by creating this uh, consortium blockchain in which anyone can own Ripple, but the people who can dot transactions are the banks. So, uh, if you recall from the last lecture, Russell talked about federated consensus, and this is what Ripple uses. Ripple only has 20% of the default tolerance, but it makes up for this with assumptions of trust that only banks can be in the system, that be less incentivized to act maliciously, and uh, there's also this mechanism in which you can reverse transactions in Ripple, which is interesting because this is something you can't explicitly do in Bitcoin. You can fork a block and regular that block 
invalid, but you can't explicitly reverse the transaction without feeding the person to, like, on the other hand, send it to the guy. Like, if someone else is that your transaction is valid, if the rest of the network wants to say that this is invalid, it should not have happened, they can revert it, even if you didn't want it to revert it. So, it gives up consistency for availability, and it makes it easier for people, or easier for banks in this case, to make transactions and clean up the mess later. So this is very important yes, for you guys, right? Which very is important. A, like a bank messaging system that's used in international payments. And the idea is kind of to compete with the purpose of our is to come up with some idea of a blockchain transaction system by which you can do the same thing. You can accomplish this global infrastructure between banks. You know, you don't need some intermediary taking days to the transactions. Instead, you reference the you reference this currency, this history, the history of this currency, and now you have a ledger by which you can act. You submit this action, and in minutes, if not seconds, you have a confirmation, which is considered legitimate by all the other things. So the current script system, um, without each bank has a script code, right? Yeah. Like, if you're sending money from, like, you know, to India, the US, it's like in some wires, or you're asking dollars, $20, right? Um, which if you increase the money around cent, it's not much. So, like, how is Ripple um, essentially competing against the conversion kind of fees are you looking at? Right. The fees I'm not sure about. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the fees. That I can't say, unfortunately. But the idea is that you no longer have to pay these exorbitant fees because you're not dealing with <coughs> individual transactions overseas or internationally. Because you just need to trust the banks are going to do whatever they do in their own currency. And that change is going to be represented as like. That change in perhaps the bank accounts. I guess it's big, if this money being sent from one bank to another, that happens to be in your account, so they can send it through Ripple, and that change represents the change in accounts. Essentially, how does Ripple make money? Mm -hmm. So, Ripple can make money based on the appreciation of their currency. So, if, uh, if, the, if this organization owns a lot of the currency and puts time to making it a solid currency and people use it, then they're going to make money on this. So it's like a direct call. And I'm sure they have a pretty good piece of silk, but yeah, that's just it. We have JP Morgan, which is an interesting one. You guys have probably heard of Jamie Diamond. He's the guy who, with the second lecture, said Bitcoin is trash, Bitcoin will fail. He's been saying it recently too, but he also says that blockchain is something to look at, blockchain is something to invest in. And continually, continuously, Jamie Morgan was participating in big <coughs> blockchain initiatives, such as the Enterprise, the Green Alliance, R3, and Hyperledger. And they're also developing Forum, which was the actual forum, it's a rap based uh, consensus, consensus blockchain that is focused on banks and trusting banks to participate in the network instead of having the dollars. So that's the Hybrid public private that you have a consortium of banks which can all, you're certain who knows, but the enemy is open source. So, one of the notes is that they want to augment the privacy because if you're a bank, you don't want people to see how much money you have, how much money your clients have, how much money you should have on the other basis. You'd rather not show, share the information. But if you want the benefits of a blockchain, it's transparency and uh, in its ability to get validation from external third parties rather than having to have someone trust your word or having an auditor, then you want to combine the two, the privacy and the blockchain. So this is what zero is there. If you've heard of Zcash, as you mentioned back in the second lecture, zero dollar proofs are a way for you to say that some statement is true without knowing the information behind it. So you're able to write the information about the transaction still valid that is the fact of value. So you can say that no bank is spending more than it has in its account while still validating that. You can validate all this without knowing how much that the bank has in its account. So it's very helpful for banks because now they no longer have to expose their information with other banks to still gain the benefits of this transparency and external validation. Golden stats. I bring Goldman Sachs up not because they necessarily have anything significant, but it's, it's interesting to see that like, where they stand. So 
So they've been exploring more cautiously being a conservative company. They haven't done anything like David Morgan has, but they are matching to the more kind of research, um, trying to see where they can use the currency or use blockchain to work for their own needs, such as wealth management and broker costs. So uh, you have an internal group that's working on information, but we're going to see how blockchain actually affects financial services. So they're much more cautious, but after other people have done the trailblazing, they may jump in like, like what happens with most other tech opportunities. In American Express, uh, this idea, I'm not sure that I completely would be behind, because I'm not sure if this is feasible or even meaningful to do with blockchain. It's taking customer reward programs and using a blockchain for data record keeping and using a currency for reward points. It seems like a lot of effort to go through in order to say that someone has a number of reward points in their, in their name, but uh, that, that's what American Express at least is considering doing. And allegedly, it's so that you can better source this information, better source this data, and that's the argument. But you can see why it doesn't work, or it may not work, because you could very easily do this with a central solution. You wouldn't think of using a blockchain here unless you were just doing it on the blockchain type thing. If you hadn't heard of a blockchain, you'd be able to, people have uh, custom work programs nowadays, no one really complains about them, no one says, oh, my number should have been 603, it was actually 602, I'm very upset, and anyone's experiencing my rewards points, I have to buy more uh, coffee bags. Whatever it is that this person is interested in, no one's really that concerned with the, uh, with the transparency of the reward points. So it, it's even a lot of overhead for for purchase of rewards points program. But some other companies and industries. You have Walmart and Alibaba. Actually, like we have these big companies that are moving a lot of goods. They want to be able to keep track of the goods that they're moving. And more importantly, if there's an issue with one of their goods, they want to be able to trace back where this issue originated. So this is why blockchain the supply chain makes sense here. Uh, Walmart's going to travel with Hyperledger movements and origins of the pork so that if there are food safety problems, they can track the origin of where this meat came from and that is something this is that vendor or other people start doing this with that vendor or, or figure out if there's a mistake that was one time frame. Alibaba is seeking to do something similar but to use counterfeiting. They want to know where the product comes from, where free is coming from, and the source, so that they now have all the information they need to validate whether or not it is truly legitimate as they claim it is. They spent about two years developing their own in-house private blockchain network in order to track. Uh, some of their some of the goods that they are afraid may be at risk of counter. They have some other corporations like theirs, which is a uh, you know shipping companies can actually use hyperledger potentially to track the movement of shipping cargo uh, for, uh, for shipping cargo and freight tracking. They have Cisco, which is interested in blockchain plus IoT. The reason why blockchain plus IoT is interesting is now you no longer need a central server to swap to, uh, to act as an intermediary for all these IoT devices. Now these devices can talk between each other and exchange information between each other and maintain a log that uh, this will eventually resolve itself without the need for some uh, some other level of, of intrusion. If you've heard of IPFS before, the Interplanetary Trial Storage System, what this allows you to do is to communicate with your peers. Let's say that Google server shut down, but you were working on some important like, profile essay for this class, and you were working on a subscriber class. So if Google server shut down, typically you'd have no way to work on your peers. With IPFS, you can share between your peers like updates to these files, and this is a single concept that you can share between devices updates without going through a central server. So you can still able to create your own server, keep track of updates, and uh, maintain a system. But this is a resiliency, so they don't need a central server at other times. Any questions so far? Yeah, go ahead. Not to sound too suspicious, but if you just said you want to use olives, would that be a perfect structure for creating and maintaining fire in content? Creating and maintaining fire in content? 
because allow some time for discussion and maybe even Q and A. But uh, today what you learn there are lots of innovative ideas uh, we can try out as IAP Gandhi member. Also learn about companies, global companies, what they are doing by the way and what the possibilities. Uh, and uh, the guy from Berkeley who talked about more than 10, maybe 20 uh, ideas or people are working upon. Levin, the guy who uh, criticized Bitcoin, and they fired the employees for uh, investing in Bitcoin, they're supporting your uh, blockchain. So that's the point, because whole blockchain's virtues are being uh, clouded and dwarfed by the bad press about Bitcoin. So, so we got to separate the two and uh, go with, uh, with the real thing. And, uh, now, people will say Bitcoin is real as well, by the way, so I don't want to debate that point. The blockchain technology, we saw that today the applications, what can be done with that, and it's a very diverse and broad <coughs> application area. The other point I want to make today before I open for Q&A and other, other comments, we saw the company's name here, right? It is, it is JP Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs and Cisco, all the uh, all other banks as well, they're all involved with uh, blockchain to some extent. Okay, so some of you or many of you want to look for a job after you graduate, knowing about blockchain and knowing how to write some applications, understanding it, will also improve your chances of getting uh, opening up more opportunities from a job point of view. And those of you who want to do entrepreneurial kind of uh, activities. To get some ideas from here and start get going from tomorrow. Don't wait for uh, next week or, or, or a month from now. Okay? So it's both, benefits both. You want to get a job after graduation, you help you. Because many companies are doing that. If you don't want to do a job, you want to get your own company, there are lots of open, so open field. You can keep the ball anywhere you want right now. Basically. And the goal was to move with you. You kick, kick the ball, ball to the east, the goal goes to the east side. You kick the ball to the west, you go to the west. Okay? This is an amazing opportunity for the blockchain generation. Do you agree or not? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So now open for any discussion, any comments, questions. So let's have a last 15 minutes to talk about it. If there's no question, then we can leave early today and have a dinner earlier. 